Collins tell you about those trees in the project? What did John Collins tell you about the chicken strike? What did he tell you about the 48 hours? All these things in the book. But in any case, I'm going to start off with this, this fist. It said black power. They intimidated so many people, white people in particular, by using that phrase, black power. Because when they used that word or that phrase, black power, it made many people think that black power meant destruction. Blowing up the Statue of Liberty or ground zero, destroying America. It wasn't anything about destroying America. It was about rebuilding America and having America to have a new paradigm in terms of how we could truly be when each and every one of us did that pledge when we was going to elementary school and junior high school about the land of the free, the home of the brave. We all wanted to be great Americans, but as young Africans, we found that something was wrong. Someone's broke, and we want to take our time to evaluate and then take our initiative to fix it. So, power. Before there was a fist, there was an open hand. This open hand encompassed people of color. Didn't have to be people of color here in the United States. But when you deal with humanity, then that means people of color around the world, and that encompasses all colors. And then you sit back and you look at these individuals, all of them are strong, all of them have a clear vision as to how things would be better. And one individual steps out amongst the five and say, I need to move this pebble, because if I move this pebble, I can make a significant change. And he reaches down and he realizes that he can't move even a pebble by himself. The other individual step out and say the same thing. I think I have a better formula. I can move this pebble he finds that he has no better luck than the other. Then they all get back together and collectively come to one point in life that we have a problem in society. And if we come together in terms of a force, we become a very powerful force. Together we can move not only that pebble, but we can move a mountain. This is what we were trying to illustrate to society. But at that time we had a right wing press they didn't particularly like me, they didn't like the way my hair looked, or they didn't like the way my skin looked, or they didn't like the way I talked or walked. But yet and still, this hair, this skin, and this walk, my God gave it to me. Oh, what's the Olympics, Pop? He said, son, that's where the greatest nations in the world get their greatest athletes and bring them together for physical competition. He said, they want to see who's more superior. They want the world to see which nation is more superior than the other. I said, well, Pop, how many black swimmers did America have? He said, none. I said, great, I'm going to be the first. <laughs> My father let me go two, three years, went by. He came to me and he said to me, he said, son, I got to talk to you. I said, what's that? He said, I hate to rain on your parade, but you will never be a swimmer representing America. <laughs> I said, why, daddy? And he did just like this. He put his hand out and he rubbed his hand. I thought he had a bug on his <laughs> I said, what's the matter? He said, son, when you used to go up to the white area to the pool, he said, you and your boys got inside the pool. As soon as y'all jumped in the water, what happened? It didn't take but a second. And you can see the picture in your mind. All the white parents jumped up. Betty, Bobby, Ricky, get out the water, Harry. Come on, get out the water. And I was very confused at the time because but they have to tell their kids to get out the water like someone's going to roll off of me and make them look like me. And then I see all the parents putting suntan lotion on them all over their face and back to lay down on the beach that look like me. And I don't know what to believe. So now in the process of going through all this, God put me in touch with a guy that I heard on the radio. This is the first guy I heard on the radio that was talking. I'm going to Adam Clayton Paul's church, Adam Senior Baptist Church, and got to realize that. There was two types of people on the black side of town. There was people that looked like me. There was black people that looked like white folks. Now I saw Adam Clayton Paul's father. He looked like me and my father. And he came out of the church that day and he said, listen, I'm not feeling well today. Tell Christians, I'm not feeling well. I'm going to let my son, Adam Jr., give the sermon today. Well, when Adam Jr. came out, he was a white man. I said, Pop, that... That's not his son. Okay, that's his son. I said, no, Daddy, that can't be his son. That's his son. And I said to him, I said, 
but he's a white man. He said, no, he's black. He said, they have some fair-skinned white people or black people. He said, but the difference is, he said, all of them are not changing over because they are ashamed of their race. He said, they change over because they want a better standard of life. He said, now, some of them get a little overzealous. He said, but this is a true black man. So I got to realize we got this going on. And then I heard this guy on the radio talking like Malcolm X. Who was this guy, Malcolm X? I was in blog with this guy. He was so prolific in his statements. He was so strong in his character on the radio until I had to find who is this guy because everybody else was going upstream. He was coming downstream with no hesitation. <laughs> who is this guy? And he said he's going to come down to 106th Street Mosque. He's going to be the teacher down there, the ruler down there. Well, I didn't have time for the games no more, spin the bottle and chase the girls. I'm trying to chase this guy to find out what he all about. And I remember going down to 116th Street, and I'm sitting in the seat just like these people in the front row. I want to be up real close because I don't want to miss nothing. But what I heard on the radio was secondary to what I heard live in terms of this individual because the way he was talking with my young mind, he was blowing too black to be so light-skinned, blowing that black. And I saw him, his skin was so fair, and I said, man, he can't be talking like that, black skin like that. But he was proud of who he was, and not only was he proud of who he was, he was proud to let black people know that they should be just as proud of who they are known with Dr. King. Now, my household, he was like God's first lieutenant. He said, no. And when he came in, I realized right away that not only was he a civil activist, or was he was a minister? But if he wanted to be on Saturday Night Live, standing up as a comic, he'd have made Grand Theft Auto because he knew how to crack some jokes and relax the people. And he sure relaxed me because he showed me and then shaking a little bit. Coming in with the big boys. So he went on and he made this statement. He said, "Listen, he said I want to come out and I want to support this Olympic boycott." I want to support the Olympic boycott. I don't want to be in charge. I want to be second in command under Harry Edwards. And we went on and had a strategy about what we're going to do and why we're going to do and how we're going to do. And then he says, out of nowhere, that he received a letter in the mail and the letter said that they had a bullet with his name on it and he wouldn't have to wait long. But when he said that, that's ringing in my brain like a big gun. So at the end of the meeting, he said, do you have any questions? I couldn't wait to throw my hand up. <laughs> yeah, Dr. King, I got a couple of questions. First question, did you ever play basketball? Did you box? Could you run? He said, I couldn't play pool. I said, well, why would you get involved in the Olympic movement? And he said to me, he said, listen, he said, imagine a boat in the middle of a lake, and everything is still and serene, the water is calm. He said, you take this rock out of the boat, and you hold it on the side and drop it. What happens? I said, well, it gets vibration. He said, absolutely, it creates waves. I go out to the far ends of the lake. He said, that Olympic boycott is that rock. He said, if you guys chose to step back from the Olympic Games, the greatest thing is that you're not killing anybody. You're not putting anybody down. As a man, as a woman, you're just making a statement, I'm choosing to step back. And he said to me also, imagine what would have happened if the black soldiers decided to step back and not go to the war. Do you think America would be as great as it is today? I said, oh, that's heavy. <laughs> <laughs> he said to me, he said, John, you said you had another question. Yes, Dr. King, I have another question. You said that they said they have a letter with a bullet with your name on it. Why would you go back to Memphis? And when he said, when he was about to say, I used to wear shades, and they didn't dilate like they do now, and I pulled my shades down. I want to look in his eyes, and I don't want to look through no glass. Why would I look in his eyes, baby girl? Why do you think so? No, not to get that. If a man tell me they're going to kill me and I don't have to wait, I'm supposed to be a little shaky. I looked to see if he was afraid to die. He was as solid as the rock of Gibraltar. And not only was he did not have no fear, when you look in someone's eyes, you know when love is in the eyes. He loved society so much until he was ready to give his life. And when you look at a picture of Gandhi, you see the same love. 
When you look at Rosa Parks, you see the same love. Or, or Paul Robertson, the same love. And my hero, John Brown, when you look at his eyes, you see the same love. These individuals made the ultimate commitment. They didn't make a partial commitment. John Collins did not make a partial commitment in 1968. If it was partial, I wouldn't be here in 2011. My day is done. But my day is not done because the war that we started years ago, long time before 68, it still goes on today. 1968. I'll tell you guys my little in a minute. I got how much? A minute and a half? Well, they got a time schedule, so we got to keep up with it. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in 1968, when you sit back and you think about it, we were young and idealistic, as David said, and we had a vision, a paradigm in terms of how can we make society better. We looked at individuals that stood up, and all those individuals died. Just like that one individual that stepped out to try and move that pebble. Couldn't do it by itself. Dr. King died. Gandhi died. Rosa Parks, all of them died. Markham died. Because it was out there by itself. It was the leaders by itself. And then we said, well, let's get these young individuals together. Let's try and make them understand. This thing called the Olympic movement is 15 minutes in the sun for any young individual that goes to the Olympics. You got 15 minutes. If I ask most of you guys in here who won the mile at the last Olympics, you couldn't tell me. If I asked you two Olympics ago, Who's the 100 meter winner? You couldn't tell. So I said, you got 15 minutes. So idealistically, we decided to get this theory going. Let's get on this train and have some discussion. Y'all want to discuss it? Well, man, I don't know about me boycotting the Olympics. I promised my church I was going to win. I, I trained too hard. My mother's expecting me to win. I can't give up my opportunity to go to the Olympics. I'm going to get this job from the Olympics. And we said, well, look, man, all we want to do is try and have some dialogue so we can have some exchange and tell you what you can do greater than that 15 minutes. Okay, I'm willing to do that. So we get on this hypothetical train, and we start rolling down the tracks. Now, all the people outside the train, they're waving, God bless America, whip Russia, whip Cuba, make sure you bring home the gold, make our metal count high. They was all excited. Now we come to the conclusion that, hey, we're going to do this thing. We're going to attempt to make this Olympic boycott possible. Everybody understand that we're going to make a better situation. We're going to make society better. Now everybody was at their crossroads in life, just like you facing your crossroads at one point or another in your life. Now we got the thing where we said, okay, we're on the same page. We're going to attempt to do something collectively that we come together as a unit. And now that we said we're going to do this, let's stop the train. Let's put out the banners on the train. Potential Olympic boycott of black athletes and anyone that's sympathetic to the cause. 1968 Olympic boycott, all the banners, all the way down the train. Now we start the train up again. Now all those people that was out there yipping, kayaking, and waving, they're gone. 